heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 164, covering the week of April 8th through April 12th, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all our social media buttons at the top of our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook, and you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You can also get this podcast by downloading our mobile app. It is free of charge. Just go to your application store, whether it's uh, Google or Apple, and pick up that app. Again, free of charge, and you do get a link to this podcast and that, along with all of our other lectures and other materials that are also free of charge. Now, if you want to help the Abbeville Institute keep those things free, you can give us a tax-deductible donation to the full extent of the law. Just go to our webpage again, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a button that says Support. Click on that, and you'll have donor levels or donor options. Click on that, and you can donate monthly, annually, or give us a one-time donation. Again, all of that is tax-deductible. You can also support the Abbeville Institute by going to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. Click on the top of the page again where it says support, and under that you'll see a button that says shop. Go there. You can get all your Abbeville Institute apparel, whether it's shirts, hats, uh, fleece uh, coats. Now, of course, it's getting springtime now, so you're not going to want that, but we got golf towels, so if you want to go out and play some golf for the spring, the summer, get an embroidered golf towel. A lot of great stuff, so pick up your Abbeville Institute apparel. All of that said... Happy birthday, Thomas Jefferson, too. This podcast is coming on Jefferson's birthday, April 13th. And, of course, one of the pieces we ran this week was in honor of Thomas Jefferson. So let's start with that one, then we'll work backwards. We had a lot of good stuff this week uh, for the the material, I should say the week material for our podcast, as well as going to provide the material for the podcast. Uh, So let's talk about this first piece. It's by Fred Erland, um, or maybe it's Ireland. Anyways, it's... it's, uh, it's an old piece. This was published at the turn of the 20th century. And um, it was it's an interesting piece because it focuses on Jefferson's library. Now, one of the things you're going to hear about the South oftentimes is that even uh, in, if you look at the South overall in the antebellum period, it was culturally and educationally backwards. Now, we know this is not true. We know that per capita, there were more Southerners who were college educated than in the North. Uh, we also know that the Southern tradition was highly intellectual. And so Jefferson's library certainly proves that. Now, one of the things I found very interesting about this piece, um, again, it was published in, let's see, 1916 in the Classical Weekly, December 4th, 1916. Um, It talks about Jefferson's uh, library that was sold to the Library of Congress. Um, And one of the interesting quotes that I found in this piece is when that was being debated, Cyrus King of Massachusetts, um, had a problem with paying Thomas Jefferson $23,000 for uh, 6,000 books. Um, And this is what he said, quote, It might be inferred from the character of the man who had collected the library and of France where the collection was made that it contained irreligious and immoral books, works of the French philosophers who caused and influenced the volcano of the French Revolution, which had disrupted Europe and extended to this country. He was opposed to the general dissemination of that infidel philosophy and of the principles of a man who had inflicted greater injury on our country than any other man except Madison. The bill would put into Jefferson's pocket $23,900 for about 6,000 books, good, bad, and indifferent, old, new, and worthless, and languages which many cannot read and most ought not. Uh, This is a Massachusetts member of Congress saying that we don't want this Jefferson stuff. I found that fascinating that here is uh, a a northerner, a New Englander, trying to block the acquisition of Jefferson's library. And the reason that Jefferson offered to sell the library is because, of course, the Library of Congress was burned down um, uh, during the War of 1812 when the British raided Washington. Uh, That's an interesting episode in and of itself. Of course, because of uh, the position at the time of uh, essentially leaving the United States open to attack at that point. I mean, Madison had wanted to uh, to actually use the Portuguese Navy to pay for them and then to outfit gunboats. Uh, this is interesting. The gunboat idea was uh, the the pre the not precursor. Uh, I should say it was 
uh, similar to using the idea of a militia, but with the Navy. So you would have the militia, which was not a regular army. Uh, but And then, of course, it would be called into service if the United States was attacked uh, or needed. And the gunboats were, exa- were the exact same thing. It was, it was like the militia of the Navy. And so uh, the idea is we would have gunboats, and these gunboats would then protect the coast of the United States. Uh, that was a very interesting idea. It didn't the, the the military infrastructure of the United States early, early here early in the twentieth century twentieth in the nineteenth century didn't work very well, um, and that was proven by the invasion of of Washington D.C. in eighteen fourteen. What knocked out the British actually was a tornado at that point. Uh, so the most famous and important tornado in American history, uh, a large tornado rolled right through their camps, and uh, that that to force the British out of Washington also put out the fires. Uh, the storm that hit Washington the next day. So, uh, But regardless, we had the Library of Congress burn. And so Jefferson says, look, he writes a letter to Thomas Cooper, uh, who, of course, is in South Carolina. And he says, hey, I've got this, I've, I've got, uh, this great library. I'll sell it. Um, and we have New Englanders saying that I want it. And now who is the section, clearly by this particular statement, uh, which is the educated section? Here's Jefferson is saying, I'll sell this stuff to you. It'd be great for the library. Uh, and Cyrus King is saying, well, a lot of these books are worthless and nobody can read them. You shouldn't even read these things. So which section was more interested in a, quote, liberal education, the North or the South? Remember, Jefferson founded the University of Virginia to combat what he called the dark Federalist mills of the North. He was afraid that Southerners were going to northern schools in large numbers, and they were coming back with northern ideas. One of those ideas, by the way, was pro-slavery ideology. Um, Pro-slavery ideology was born in the North, long before it became the dominant intellectual position of the South. You had northerners, or at least when it came to, um, to slave labor, you had northerners defending it because abolitionists were attacking it there, in large numbers. And the very first pro-slavery tract was actually in, in America. It was actually written in 1701 in Massachusetts. Uh, and you had uh, the, the leaders of these Ivy League, what we call the Ivy League schools now in New England, very much uh, in line with pro-slavery ideologues. Uh, in fact, they were pushing it. You know, If you look at Dwight of Yale, which is where Calhoun attended, there's, it's no coincidence Calhoun uh, I had a position of uh, on, on pro-slavery thought that was very similar to what White had to say about pro-slavery uh, in the antebellum period. So uh, the, the North was responsible for much of that, uh, that type of uh, discourse in the South. And not just that, the South was certainly a much more liberal in terms of uh, educational qualities, liberal section than the North. Uh, in the 19th century. And Jefferson exemplified that. He personified it. Uh, and so when you think about the, the United States, you think, well, all these dumb Southerners. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Southerners had more college graduates per capita. Southerners were better educated per capita uh, than Northerners. And so um, it's, it's, um, it's a very important distinction to make. And of course, this little piece gets into the things that I mean, Jefferson's library uh, included, as, as Cyrus King says, uh, several works written in, in Latin, Greek. Um, he was in French. He was translating. Jefferson was 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 a famous for double columning work, and he would have the the uh, original language on the left and the and the English translation on the right, and so he could go through it. He loved to read Cicero. Uh, so this is a well educated man, uh, one of the most intelligent men in American history, particularly in American political history, and. Uh, now Jefferson's just reduced to a guy who supposedly had uh, an indelicate affair with uh, one of his slaves, and he's known as a slaveholder. In fact, we have to take Jefferson out. We can't have Jefferson anywhere. But this is one of the best men that America has ever produced intellectually. Um, One of the most intelligent men who's ever sat in the executive office. But yet now he has to be reduced to uh, simply a slave owner. Uh, this is how bad the political, uh, the politically uh, correct position has become. How bad political correctness has gotten. 
Um, and of course, that's something we talk about a lot on this particular podcast. And that has, I mean, look, if you look at what Cyrus King is saying here, that's north over south. This is a northern position on Thomas Jefferson. You could almost say this today about Thomas Jefferson. I mean, people do. They're very critical of Jefferson. And um, very critical of the South. So what's happened over time, of course, is an anti-reconciliation position following the war. Remember, after the war, we had a reconciliation position. The North and the South are going to get back together. They're going to, they were going to put down the, the, the rifle. They were going to shake hands across the chasm. They were going to try to get back to doing the good work of America, heal the wounds of the war eventually heal the wounds of Reconstruction, and we were going to move on. We're going to pretend like that never, I mean, look, we know it happened. Uh, we're going to honor the people that died north and south. That's what Confederate monuments are all about, by the way. We're going to honor the people that died north and south. Northerners were building them in large numbers as well. So we're going to do this all about the same time, and we're going to reconcile the sections, and we're going to make America great. Uh, we're going to get back to doing the work that uh, that led America to be uh, have a vibrant economy and uh, be a, an attractive place for the world. And that happened for several decades. It's not really until you get to the last half of the 20th century that you start seeing this position challenged. Now, even African Americans, right at the end of the war, respected Robert E. Lee and had a reconciliation position a lot of times. Now, not all, of, not all African Americans did. We know W.E.B. Du Bois did not. But uh, well, the piece we ran on Thursday, so I'm kind of working backwards here, and I'll get into you know northern transformation of the United States. The piece we ran on Thursday, Respect Across the Bow, was written by uh, Gerald Lefergie. Uh, he's a, an independent scholar in Australia, interested in Robert E. Lee and reconciliation in the war. And he, he writes about... Thomas Morris Chester. Now, Thomas Morris Chester was a reporter for the Philadelphia Press. He was very critical of the South, very critical of the Southern War effort. But when the war was over, he wrote a description of Lee coming back into Richmond after the surrender. And it's remarkable because of its conciliatory tone. And so I want to read this. I want to read what Chester said. And how Lefergie is saying, look, this is, this is important because here you have this guy that was uh, an African-American. Um, he certainly didn't favor the Southern position. He was completely against secession. But when Lee comes back, this is Robert E. Lee. This is not just some nobody. This is Robert E. Lee. And the respect that, that Chester showed Lee is amazing, particularly when Everyone now is trying to tear down Lee. This is an African-American in 1865. This is what he said, quote, The excitement of yesterday was the arrival here of General Lee and his staff about 3 o'clock p.m. The chieftain looked fatigued and rode along at a jaded gait. The general with affable dignity received the marks of respect which were manifested by those who happened along the pavement. Several efforts were made to cheer him, which failed until within a short distance of his residence, previous to which his admirers satisfied themselves with quietly waving their hats and hands, when they were most, where they were most successful. At his mansion on Franklin Street, where he alighted from his horse, he immediately uncovered his head, thinly covered with silver hairs, as he had done in acknowledgment of the veneration of the people along the streets. There was a general rush of the small crowd to shake hands with him. During these manifestations, not a word was spoken, and when the ceremony was through, the general bowed and ascended his steps. The silence was then broken by a few voices calling for a speech to which he paid no attention. The general then passed into his house and the crowd dispersed. The military authorities here will extend every consideration to Lee. Orders will be promulgated affording him and his staff such protection and accommodation as their circumstances may require. And Chester had no problem with this. Listen to the tone of that. It's reconciliation. Here's this great man. We're going to take care of this man. Look at these people. They still love him. They wanted to make a speech. The war is over, but they want him to make a speech. He didn't say anything nasty or negative about Lee. It wasn't necessary. But if this piece was written in 2019, it would have been about how bad Lee was, how awful he was, how, uh, I mean, all the terrible things we can, make, we, can, we can make up about him because a lot of it's made up. 
But no, in 1865, from an African-American, Lee was a great American who deserved respect and accommodation and protection. Protection from what? Well, we know what he's being protected from. Nowadays, his statue afford, is afforded no protection, no accommodation, no respect. It doesn't matter what sta- where you're talking about. These statues are being vandalized, abused, taken down. But of course, that was not the case. That's what people thought of Robert E. Lee in 1865 when they had every reason to believe that about Robert E. Lee. This man was just leading the army that was shooting at them. And yet, here we have Robert E. Lee respected. But again, because of modern PC, because of the modern academy, because of all the things that go on in modern modern academic establishment, Robert E. Lee now has to be demonized and vilified. And every bad word, every pejorative that you can think of has to be leveled at Robert E. Lee. He's a traitor. That's the one that's used most often. But there's others, of course. All right, so uh, I thought that piece was really interesting. I thought it was a a nice addition to the website um, because it it showed the complexity of, of American society in the 1860s. We often lose sight of that, how complex American society was, Southern society, Northern society. There are complexities there. We lose sight of that. We lose track of that. Well, let's keep working backwards because the assault on the Southern tradition continues with the modern uh, push to abolish the Electoral College. And uh, this is part of North over South again because, see, we're in another Reconstruction. What's happening here is that the North is not happy that they could potentially lose an election. They have lost an election because they won the popular vote, but lost in the Electoral College. So they just want to get rid of the Electoral College. We'll just just do away with that. We won't have this albatross, which you even hear things, people people saying things like, well, the Electoral College was created to defend slavery. No, it wasn't. The Electoral College is there uh, because of slavery. No, it wasn't. Not at all. You can't find any evidence in the Philadelphia Convention or the debates of the ratification of the Constitution where there was ever anything brought up about slavery being the driving force behind the Electoral College. And the reason you can't find it is because it doesn't exist. This little piece is by Walt Garlington. It's a neat piece uh, because he does bring it back to the South. I mean, he brings up, you know, it's kind of a, a national story where states are thinking about dumping the Electoral College. And he says, look, this is bad for the South. It's bad for conservatives in America. Um, But more importantly, the South. And when you look at what he says about it, when you look at what Garlington says about it, Um, he says, quote, Andrew Lytle saw one of the weaknesses of the South in her being too caught up in fighting defensive battles rather than going the offensive. In addition to the above, as it regards the Electoral College in particular, there needs to be a counterproposal to the national popular vote. One idea that we would offer is to allow the government of the states to elect the federal president. This seems beneficial for two reasons. First, it would simply... I'm sorry, it would simplify the election process and reinforce the idea of the equality of the states in the union by guaranteeing each state one vote for the president. Second, it would give the states a greater measure of power over the federal government. And third, it would put an end to the silly melodrama that presidential elections have become thanks to the talk radio, cable news, etc. We do not need an entire season dedicated to the selection of the federal president as though this were somehow as important as the Christmas season or the growing season for crops. That, of course, brings us to our last two pieces of the week, our book review, 
which is a book um, a, a book that everyone should pick up. It's a it's a Shotwell Press book. It's by the Kennedy Twins, and it's Yankee Empire. And that particular piece and the piece that I wrote for Monday follow a similar line of thinking, and that is that the Reconstruction period was bigger than just Reconstruction. And um, I'll talk a little more about that here in a couple minutes when I get to my piece. But this particular book um, came out last year, um, and it's uh, all the Shotwell books are paperback. You can't get them in hardback. But it's a, it's a really interesting book, and I think this is one thing that people don't do enough of, is looking at the, the long perspective of the war. What did the war actually produce? So we've got anti-reconciliation now dominating American political discourse. Um, on, from the neoconservatives and the left. I mean, look, they're, they're, in, they're together on this. The neoconservatives want to show that somehow the Republican Party is the savior of America. And that it was if, if we just had been good Republicans all along, America would have been different. You see, because they're trying to say Lincoln's their guy. They try to attach themselves to the radical Republicans of the Reconstruction period. And ignore, and it's because Reconstruction has become about one particular topic, and that, of course, is the plight of former slaves, the freedmen in the South. What's going to happen to them? And uh, the this is an interesting topic. I mean, look, um, what Lincoln would have done with this situation is really interesting. We know that Lincoln, uh, by 1865, was favoring limited suffrage for those who had served maybe in the military, but a, a, a large-scale suffrage movement for former slaves had not really taken hold of the conservative side of the Republicans. But eventually, they figured out that uh, former slaves mean votes. And this is the only way the Republican Party is going to stay in power. We know that Grant would have lost, for example, in 1868, if not for the fact that large sections of Southern society have been disfranchised and large sections of Southern society have been enfranchised. So you have uh, uh, black voters outnumbering white voters in the South. And because Grant picks up the South, he wins the presidency in 1868. This is well known that Grant probably would have lost in 1868. Had, had Lincoln's plan of reconciliation and reconstruction carried forward or Johnson's plan not been defeated, uh, we have a situation where Grant doesn't win the presidency in 1868. If we didn't have the radicals in control of Congress, Grant is not your president. We get President Seymour. Uh, so, I mean, this is a really interesting situation that we have uh, with, uh, with this particular period of American history. But... Uh, that said, Reconstruction produced all kinds of changes in American society. Certainly, uh, the effort to demonize anything in the South gained steam in the 1860s. It was a period of time, as I think uh, uh, Blair has shown, and with malice towards some, that reconciliation was not the dominant position of a large swath of Northern society. They wanted the South punished. Uh, but by 18... But look by the 1868 election, that had that had waned just a little bit. Um, 1868 is a really important year. It's a transitionary year uh, period. And not just that, um, I think that Americans, there, there was a growing sentiment in the North that Reconstruction uh, was, in the way that the radicals were pursuing, it was not necessarily a good idea. And as we see, uh, as, we, as we move forward, now we know 1872, when you had Horace Greeley actually run for president, uh, and then suffer a stroke. And even though he died before the Electoral College met, there were still people voting for Horace Greeley. That's how much people didn't like Reconstruction. Uh, Greeley had been an ardent, ardent abolitionist, someone who was certainly in favor of prosecuting the war. But when the war is over, he takes a fairly different stance. In fact, Horace Greeley uh, was interested in uh, freeing Jefferson Davis because he said, look, this is pointless. We don't need to try Jefferson Davis for treason. This is an American position, essentially. Uh, one of the secret six, Garrett, who had been one of, the, one of the men who funded the secret six that led to John Brown's raid 
in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, actually also helped pay to get Jefferson Davis out of jail. So there were people saying, okay, wait a second here. Uh, Reconstruction's going too far. Even in 1868, but Grant wins because you have uh, the 14th Amendment. And of course, then you ultimately had to have the 15th Amendment to, to ensure that former slaves could vote in the South. But not women. Women were very upset about that too. But that's going to create a whole different America. It's a recreation of America. The, the Yankee Empire is created in the post-bellum period. American foreign policy was highly influenced by uh, the crusading zeal that took hold of the Republican Party and what they did in the South. If they couldn't do it in the South, if they couldn't finish it there, then they're going to do this to the Western Indian tribes. And then if they couldn't do that, they're going to go and look at things like Cretan independence and uh, we're going to start spreading American liberty and democracy to all corners of the world. This is why one of the reasons why we have uh, one of the intellectual uh, backing of the Spanish-American War, because this is, uh, this is going to convert these heathen peoples of Cuba and the Philippines. Uh, these are just the new Southerners. And so when you look at this period of time, when you look at the war and the byproduct, the war itself, and what came out of that, it was the Yankee Empire. It was a recreation of America. We don't live in the America of 1860. And it's not just about slavery. You see, it's about everything. The economy of 1860 was different. Uh, there was a certain, the South was able to block the Hamiltonian system that is foisted on America once the war begins and then um, codified when the war is over. This is why you have the populist revolution of the uh, the populist reaction of the 1880s and 90s uh, because Western farmers woke up and said, oops, I think we made a mistake. We cut a deal with these New Englanders, these industrialists, and they're not, they don't want the same kind of policies and, and programs that we want. We They want something else, and it's not going to help farmers. And so farmers north and south united. This is where I think one of the most interesting uh, political parties was the National Democratic Party uh, of 1896, when you had a Union Confederate ticker, ticket. John Palmer was the presidential candidate, a Union veteran, and the vice presidential candidate was Simon Bolivar Buckner. And they were, sometimes they're called the Gold Democrats, but this was a conservative Democrat party. They, had, they didn't like the direction that Bryan was going in, but uh, still, there were a lot of Southerners that supported Bryan and the populist movement because, again, these people are farmers, and they think that the the effort of the North, the Republican Party, was the Hamiltonian economic system. So we get that. We get foreign adventurism. William McKinley. It's no, it's no coincidence. William McKinley, elected in 1896, then again in 1900, we get the Spanish-American War. We get Teddy Roosevelt out of that because McKinley, of course, is assassinated in 1901. We get, in some ways, the modern presidency. There's, it's, there's no coincidence. McKinley's a Republican. The Republican Party was interested in this. Uh, we get north over south when it comes to history and education and art and literature, all kinds of things. I mean, even things as simple as ball games, right? Ball games came out of the north. It's just that nowadays the south does them better. Southerners play ball, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, take your pick, better than Northerners, generally. <laughs> uh, so it, it's it's funny how that works. But Southerners were interested in things like blood sports, uh, horse racing, uh, things like that. It wasn't until after the war that you start seeing ball games really take hold in the South. And so this is when I, you know, I write in my piece, uh, you know, Reconstruction and Recreation, and it's it's... Uh, focusing on a class that I'm offering at McClanahan Academy. Just go out there, mclanahanacademy.com. Uh, you can pick up this new course on reconstruction and recreation. Um, the idea of this particular course is to show the war in the long durée and show reconstruction in the long durée. This is kind of like part two of my war class. Um, but I, I actually take reconstruction out to the 1970s because a lot of the things that happened in the 20th century are a byproduct of reconstruction. The imperial presidency is a byproduct of Reconstruction, just nationalism in general. The idea that every issue has to be a national issue in America, the loss of federalism, the loss of state powers, all of that is certainly part of Reconstruction. The remaking of the federal judiciary, it's all part of Reconstruction. 
It's cultural, it's political, it's economic, it's diplomatic, it's military. The fact that we have a standing army the way we do, the new National Guard, all of that is comes out of this this a changing perspective on America. America is a nation, not a federal republic. All of that is a byproduct of Reconstruction. And so I go through all that in my course, and I go through that in the piece, and I talk about how Reconstruction is becoming popular again. People are focusing on it. And the reason they're focusing on it is because you can turn the attention to one particular issue, and that's race. And you can say the entire period was all about race, which we know it wasn't. Race certainly was an issue, and it was used, as Hiram Rhodes' rebels talked about, as a distraction. Former slaves were pawns in a bigger game to try to recreate America, to vote Republican and change things. This is why you had such a laser beam focus on the freedmen in the South, because Republicans knew. This is what Lincoln said, what shall we do with the Negro? What shall we do? I mean, Stevens asked Lincoln that, Alexander Stevens, and Lincoln's response was, root hog or die. They can root hog or die for all I care, as long as they vote Republican. Now, he didn't say that, but that was the idea. If we can get them voting Republican, the Freedmen's Bureau, all the things that come out of that, it's all about votes so that the Republican Party can stay ascendant, that it can keep winning elections and by key, and it can stay in power. And Lincoln's objective was always power. And one thing we know about Lincoln, he was trying to create a new type of party before, in, this, is, this is Paul Escott, he was saying, look, Lincoln wanted to create a moderate party that was going to be in, include moderate Southerners, maybe people like Alexander H. Stevens, and conservative Northerners, Republican and Democrat, and they were going to marginalize the radical side. And so radical re reconstruction never would have taken place, perhaps if Lincoln had not been assassinated in April of 1865. It's highly possible. It never happens. So um, reconstruction is an important part of the uh, the American experience. And this is why our summer school, which I did not mention at the beginning, I saved us to the end. This is why our summer school is going to focus on Reconstruction and the New South, which is a byproduct of Reconstruction. Our 17th annual summer school in Seabrook Island, South Carolina, is going to focus on uh, that particular issue. We have a lot of great talks that are going to be there. It's going to talk about uh, you know Reconstruction, the long durée, the New South, this idea that you have uh, a changing America. And of course, a changing South is part of it. How does the South react to this? So it's a really good topic. I hope you can make it out to our summer school. Um, and I hope you enjoyed our material for this week. And until next time, good day. Good day.